Well, Fraser, a very warm welcome. It's just lovely to see you all today. And let me begin with some words from the Bible. This is from Psalm 46. And whatever kind of a week you've had, uh, try and, let's try and focus on this together as we meet today. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Well, my name's, uh, my name's Sam. I'm the minister here. It's great to have you here, especially if you're here for the first time. We hope you have a lovely time, uh, whether that's in person or online. And if you're here with us online, we're thrilled to have you with us um, today as well. Uh, we'll be meeting for about 45 minutes or so. Uh, we'll be sharing communion as well, but I will be explaining that later in the service. If you're not familiar with that, then that's nothing to, um, nothing to, 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 to worry about. In the run-up to Easter, we're, we're thinking about the last 24 hours or so of Jesus' life. And uh, we're right at the last few moments, really, as we uh, continue this week. And we're beginning our services with some words from the Old Testament, written perhaps 600 years before Jesus was born, and yet looking ahead to what Jesus would do on the cross for us. So this is from Isaiah 53. And I'll read the words um, to start with, and if you respond in, it with the words... In bold. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to meet together today, to learn more of Jesus from the Bible and what it means to follow him. And we pray that whatever we, we know or don't know um, yet, we pray that you'd be uh, working in all of our hearts. And we pray that our hearts will be open and receptive to all that you'll be saying as we meet today. And we pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to start with our first song, uh, one for us to listen to rather than sing along to, but some amazing words helping to paint the picture of Jesus heading to the cross for us. Thank you. 
so much for Jesus. Thank you that there is no one like him. And thank you that his death on the cross for us reveals a depth of love that we, we can't fathom, but it's so great. And yet we're also aware that often we just go through our, our lives without really thinking much about you or living your ways. And so just in a moment of quiet, I'd invite us to bring to the Lord any areas of our own lives, we're, we're, we're aware that we've actually been walking away from God in his good ways. Father, we confess these to you, knowing that you're a good and gracious God, and that through Jesus you offer us full forgiveness, and we thank you in his name. Amen. Well, we're going to continue the um, continue the story now as we hear these last few uh, this last day or so of Jesus' life. Uh, Francis Williams will be reading for us. Francis is with us online and has provided a reading ahead of time. So let me just go and uh, plug that in, and I'll uh, play it for us. And do follow along on the service sheets if you'd like as well. The reading is in Luke chapter 22, verse 66 to 23, verse 25. Jesus before Pilate and Herod. At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together, and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me, and if I asked you, you would not answer. 
But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You said that I am. Then they said, Why do we need any more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Then the whole assembly rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests in the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirred up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. On hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased, because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him before the sign of some sort. He plied him with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him. Dressing him in an elegant robe, they sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers and the people, and said to them, You brought me this man as the one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he spoke to them, Why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore I will have him punished and then release him. But with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. Okay, let's, uh, let's pray as we look at these words together. So Father, we thank you again for the Bible. Thank you for all that we learn uh, there about Jesus and uh, the good news that, that, uh, that he is for us. And we pray that we'd be strengthened in that good news and would understand more clearly why it is that Jesus came and what it will mean for us to be um, his people uh, this coming week. And we pray that for Jesus' sake. Amen. So this week I came across a, um, a survey that had been conducted of um, 28 different nations trying to work out how trusting different countries are as a whole. Um, any ideas where Britain came in the list of 28? Twenty seventh. <laughs> so there's only one other country in this in this sample that they use less trusting than uh, British people, and uh, that's the Russians. So well, it turns out that at least if that service is believed, we are a pretty cynical lot. Um, I looked at some other some other um, kind of bits and bobs on this. Do you know only twenty seven percent of us think that Boris Johnson is trustworthy? And if you think that's just about Boris, then only twenty nine percent of us think Sakir Strama is trustworthy either. In fact, less than half of us read the BBC News website and think they are giving us an unbiased account. Okay, so, so we, we, are, we are a pretty c c cynical bunch, but if I, if I ask the question personally to you, then how would you answer it? If, if I said, you know, what are you most cynical about in life? Um, how, how easy do you find it to trust uh, institutions or other people? I wonder what you'd. Um, I wonder what your answer would be. One of the problems with this is that there is plenty of evidence behind being a bit cynical. I mean, there are so many examples of people or institutions who have just got it 
spectacularly wrong. And it's always on the front page of a newspaper. And that breeds a certain kind of cynicism, doesn't it, over time? And certainly religious institutions are not immune from that. And I would be amazed if there aren't some people here who, in fact, I'd imagine all of us here have at least one friend who will, will never touch a religious institution because they have had such a negative experience at some point in their lives. Pro probably all of us, Nate, perhaps, perhaps someone in this room, actually that has been part of your own journey um, as well. And for some of us, when we ask this question about being a bit cynical or finding it hard to trust, actually it's a very personal thing because some of us have had our trust abused and therefore actually we find it hard to trust anybody um, anymore. So he, he, here's, here's the thing, we, 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 we hate the idea of being just naive and just believing anything, but when we think about it, being just cynical is not exactly a very kind of, doesn't leave us in a very good place either. So what do we do? And, and what, does the, what does the Bible, what does Jesus have to say about this, about this whole area? Well, as I say, we're, we're following this, this journey to the cross. And as we look at the cross, we see both a, a, a spotlight, as it were, on humanity, on, on, on us as a whole. But we also see a spotlight on Jesus. And it's just we see both of those that it helps us to kind of address some of the issues that we have just raised. And I think certainly our passage today is going to, going to help us as well. So do you remember the story so far? Jesus has been... Um, betrayed, he has been arrested, he's been led away, he's had an all-night kind of interrogation by the Jewish religious rulers. And now it's early morning on the day that he's going to be crucified, and he is led to Pilate. So do you see chapter 23, verse 1? And then the whole assembly, that's the kind of Jewish um, ruling authorities, they rose up and they led him off to Pilate. Now, um, Pilate, he is the Roman governor for Judea. So um, the, the Jewish people are occupied by the Romans at this point. Pilate is the guy who is essentially their occupying boss. His job, he was responsible really for, for two main things. One was keeping the peace, a bit of stability with the occupied people. The second was raising money, okay, keeping a steady stream of revenue and kind of taxation. Um, but as well as that, only Pilate and his government had the authority to issue the death penalty. And that's why the Jewish leaders have to take Jesus to Pilate, because they are desperate for Jesus to be convicted of death, but they don't have the power to do it. So they take them, take them to Pilate. So here's the job they've got on their hands. They have to persuade Pilate that this man, Jesus, deserves the death penalty and so that's what we see them going about doing. Do you see from verse two? They began to accuse him, that's Jesus, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. Messiah, a very kind of Jewish word, um, just means promised king. And so they translate it for this Gentile man so that he understands. But can you see how sneaky they are? How clever they are? They, they, they make Jesus out to be this violent revolutionary and they push all of Pilate's buttons. So he's the guy who's got to keep the peace. And so they say he's subverting our nation. He's the guy who's got to raise the taxes. And so they say he opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and uh, claims, to be a, claims to be a king. And so, so Pilate asked Jesus, verse three, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. And then this is the key thing. Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. Now, this is going to be a, a kind of theme through this passage. Um, and it's this. Jesus says Pilate is innocent. Okay. He, he's obviously done nothing deserving crucifixion. But the, but the Jewish people are utterly insistent, aren't they? So verse, verse five, they insist he stirs up the people all over Judea. And, um, and so Pilate, hearing that he's from Galilee, thinks, oh, I can get someone else to share, kind of share the load here. Because Herod, who is a Jewish ruler of Galilee, happens to be in Jerusalem. 
And so Pilate thinks, great, we'll send Jesus off to Herod. So that's exactly what he does. Um, verse, um, verse seven, he sent him to Herod, who was in Jerusalem at the time. Now, Herod, he is, we, we, we know a little bit about Herod from the rest of Luke's gospel. He is a nasty piece of work, basically. Actually, his whole family were a pretty nasty piece of work. And um, already this Herod has, has chopped off the head of Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist. And um, already, he, rumor has it that he wants to kill Jesus as well. We, we, we picked that up earlier on in Luke's gospel um, as well. But he's fascinated by Jesus. So can, can you see that in verse 8? When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because he locked, for a long time he'd been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some kind of sign. So he plied him with these questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. Uh, the chief priests and teachers of the law were standing there vehemently accusing him. They've not given up. But then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. And that day, Herod and Pilate become friends. Now, Herod may be mocking Jesus, but he also has ha found no basis for a charge against him. That's why he sends him back to Pilate. And so it carries on. Verse 13, Pilate calls together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, and he, re he repeats the basic point here. You brought me this man as one who is inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and find no basis for your charges against him, and neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us, as you can see. He's done nothing to deserve death. Okay, he, he's obviously innocent, says Pilate. He's obviously innocent. And yet, the crowd shouts, away with him, release Barabbas. Pilate has another go, verse 20, wanting to release Jesus. He appeals to them. The crowds cry, crucify. And then for the final time, verse 22, why, what crime has this man committed? I find no grounds for the death penalty, therefore I'll release him. And then you get what I think are the three most chilling words in this whole account. There in verse 23. With loud shouts, they insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. Gosh, that's chilling, isn't it? Their shouts prevailed. So here is brute force has just trampled underfoot justice and truth. It's amazing. Here is, here is kind of political expediency and an easy life for Pilate, completely, completely railroading anything that is good and fair. And if that sounds familiar, well, sadly, we all know in our own world, it is all too familiar. So many people still cry out for justice in the way that Jesus was denied justice um, himself. And so verse 24, Pilate decided to grant their demands. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, and the one they asked for, and surrendered Jesus to their will. So who's to blame? Who's to blame? Let's put it another way. Who, who is guilty of this innocent man's blood? Well, quite a few people, aren't there? So I mean, we can run through them. We've got the religious leaders. Now, this is astonishing, right? These guys are topping up the major religious institution of the time. They are meant to be a picture of kind of a moral example for the nation. Do you remember the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not lie. What have they done? They have lied about Jesus. He opposes paying taxes to Caesar. No, he, he, he actually said the opposite. You should pay taxes to Caesar. Thou shalt not murder. These are, these are basic commands. I mean, we know those ones. And here they are leading off an innocent man to murder. So they, they, are, they are guilty, aren't they? They say this man is, is, is kind of, you know, inciting the crowds. 
That's exactly what they are doing as they kind of egg the crowd on to, 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 to get Jesus crucified, the religious leaders. But it's not just them. And we see Pilate as well. I mean, Pilate is the one who has to make the final decision here. Oh, we've got some dogs. No, that's fine, don't worry. No, your dogs are always very welcome. And indeed, you are as well, ladies. Come and join us next time. Oh, that would be fabulous. <laughs> Thanks for popping in. <laughs> okay, so Pilate, he, he is in a position of, okay, he's the guy who makes the final call here. He tries to say it's someone else's fault. But goodness me, what is he thinking as he goes to bed that night? I mean, he has just condemned someone who he knew was innocent. You know, I think, I think one of the things about any form of leadership is it always requires great moral courage. And Pilate, well, he ends up, he ends up a coward, actually. But, but it's not just Pilate, it's Herod as well. I mean, here's this guy, he's affluent, he's powerful. And as is so often the case with affluent, powerful people, he just assumes that he's above God, above Jesus. He has a kind of faint interest, but at the end of the day, there's no genuine engagement. He plies Jesus with questions, but Jesus can see what's in his heart, and so he just remains silent. By the way, in this whole account, how many words does Jesus utter? Four. Do you remember that prophecy in Isaiah? As a sheep before the shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And that's exactly what we see here with Jesus. Okay, so there's Herod, he's guilty, but then there's the people as well. And this, you know, the thing is, we think, well, I'm not a religious leader, I'm not really like, I'm, I'm not in a kind of position of leadership or responsibility, but I think this is where it gets us. Because do you see, by verse 12, sorry, by verse 13, do you see who turns up? Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people. And then by verse 18 to 19, she see who is shouting. It's the whole crowd away with this man. Release Barabbas. We'll, we'll think about that in a sec. And verse 21, they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. So these are just, this is, these are like your everyday Joes. Okay, they just happen to be there. And yet they too end up crying for Jesus to be, to be crucified. It's everyone. Um, maybe you remember back, back in, right back at the start of Luke's gospel, um, Jesus is eight days old and his parents take him to the temple and that there are a few things he's got to do there. It's a, a, a little like a kind, of back, a kind of christening today, but there he is at the temple. And whilst he's at the temple, there's, a, there's an old man called Simeon who comes and he talks to Jesus' mum, Mary, and listen to what he says. Jesus, eight days old, listen to what Simeon says. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Isn't that interesting? The thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. The thoughts of the religious leaders' hearts reveal hypocrisy, crucify him. The thoughts of the Gentile leaders, Pilate, representing them, revealed, crucify him. The, the, the thoughts of the affluent and wealthy, the powerful, revealed, crucify him. The thoughts of everyday people, revealed, crucify him. And so later on, after Jesus has died, he's risen from the dead again. Um, the apostles are finding that there is a similar level of opposition as they now preach about Jesus. And this is what they do in the face of that opposition. This is Acts chapter four. They pray, they say to, to, to God, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. This is Psalm two, this is in the Old Testament. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And then listen to what they say. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. And so do you see the point? Okay, Jewish people, 
Gentile people, the leaders and the everyday folk, all of them join together to do what? To condemn Jesus. I mean, it's extraordinary. And so the point is that actually none of us are free of guilt. But the tragic irony when we look at the crucifixion of Jesus is there was only one person who was innocent that day. And that is the guy who was condemned. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's like this whole kind of murky sea of guilt and shame and, and mixed motives. And, and yet in the middle of it, pure as anything, steady as a rock is Jesus. Again, it's not just that he, he's guilty of nothing deserving the death penalty. He's not guilty of anything. But the, the only thing that they could find to say against Jesus was stuff that they just made up. Now, listen, this, in a world that feels so murky, even today, don't you think this provides us with some hope? Jesus, totally pure, totally good. I don't know what you made of the, um, the movement that started six months ago. Do you remember when they started toppling the statues? And it was Edward Colston, I think, in Bristol, who was the first one who went. And do you remember the pictures? The statue was toppled. Now, he did a lot of good things for Bristol, but you, you dig a little deeper, and goodness me, there's some pretty murky stuff that he was involved in, slave trade and so on. And, and then people started looking at the other statues. And, you know, the, the more you look at these great monuments you revere, you do a bit of digging and what do you find? Wherever you look, there's a dark side to people. And as, as statue after statue was toppling, you think, goodness me, is there anyone who can stand? Well, of course, there is just one person who can stand. And that's Jesus. You will never find a dark side to Jesus. Now, of course, people will take Jesus and abuse him for all their own kind of evil purposes. Plenty of examples of that. But Jesus himself, you will never find a dark side to Jesus. And, and, and that, listen, that's great news for us because it means that some of us here who... You know, actually, we feel like we've been let down by our families. We've been, we've been let down by church, perhaps. Been let down by our friends. Been let down by the system, by the politicians. Well, listen, you will never be let down by Jesus. So some of us, perhaps, we, we just don't actually feel that safe at home or perhaps at church. There's been some abuse in the past and, and we struggle to trust people. But listen, if you trust in Jesus, he, he will never let you down. You're safe, you're safe with him. Because whilst everyone else is guilty, Jesus is innocent. But there's, 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 there's more and we, we need to finish on this. Um, and this is, this is what makes Jesus such good news for us if we have struggled to trust anyone else. This is what makes Jesus such good news for us. And the picture is given to us with this man Barabbas. Do you see it in verse 18 to 19? We'll finish with this. Verse 18 to 19. Let me get that sorry, passage. Okay, the whole crowd shouted, away with this man, release Barabbas to us. And here's the, Barabbas' little bio. Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. So do you see, this is the irony. Barabbas had done the very things that Jesus was being falsely accused of. And here's what happens. Okay, so Barabbas, to, you know, we, we can put him on his side pretty fairly. Okay? I mean, he's... He is as guilty as, 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 as they come. But here's the thing we see happening. Okay, Barabbas gets counted as innocent, and Jesus gets counted as guilty. Now, that is an amazing picture, in fact, of what Jesus came to do for all of us. Let me try and illustrate it like this.
That did not rip as smoothly as I was hoping. Okay, here's what's happened, okay? If guilty, are counted innocent. And Jesus is counted guilty. That's what we're having for Barabbas. That's the picture of what Jesus offers for all of us. Now, listen, it's, this is important because this isn't automatic. It's not that the leaders were automatically counted as innocent by Jesus' death. They had to respond, okay? But here's, here's how it worked. Jesus on the cross, he faced the punishment. He bore the guilt for all of the wrong things that we have done because we've got to find ourselves in this list somewhere as well, so that if we trust in him, we can be counted now as innocent. So on the, on the day of Pentecost, after Jesus risen from the dead, the first ever sermon, Peter looks at the crowd of people, you know, many of the people who had been crying crucify, he said, the one whom you crucified is the Messiah. And do you know what the people say? They say, what shall we do? And do you know how Peter answers? He says, repent and be baptized. Okay, all you have to do is turn back to Jesus, trust in him, and as you crown him as your king, then you get transferred to the innocent side. It is the most amazing good news. All of this, of course, happened at the Passover. Do you remember the Jewish festival of Passover? What kind of lamb was it that had to die? A lamb without blemish, perfect lamb. And so Jesus died as the perfect lamb, the perfect substitute for us, the innocent one for the guilty. So, here, so, here, so this is the big invitation then that Jesus offers to all of us here in, in his word today. Give me your guilt and I will give you my innocence. That's the invitation he holds out clearly to all of us. Give me your guilt and I will give you my innocence. You know, I got a letter this week from a guy who I knew from a previous role before I was living here in Henley. He, you know, he started coming along to church. I won't tell you his name for kind of uh, confidentiality but he, he started coming along to, to church he got, got a little bit involved in song and then tragically about six months ago I found I, he was all over the news he'd done an awful awful thing he's now in a high security prison and he was convicted as as as, as guilty um, just before Christmas and he wrote me this letter this week and he said I'm dear Sam and Lucy that's my wife Lucy I'm truly saddened by my crimes I've messed my life up I want to change. I need God's help. I don't like how I've turned out to be. I really need help. And as I was preparing this talk, and as I got this letter through the post, I thought, isn't that amazing that actually even someone like this friend of mine, prison, if he trusts in Jesus, Jesus will give him his innocence because he will take the guilt in his place. And the truth is, you don't need to be in prison to feel guilty. Okay, actually most of us know that guilt can be its own prison that we're trapped by. And that's why Jesus' invitation is so powerful today. Give me your guilt and I will give you my innocence. I, I made these little cards. I think most of them fell out on the floor, but you'll see these little, little cards. And it just has a sentence from the passage that we've looked at today. And it says, I find no basis for charge against. Now that was said of Pilate about Jesus, but here's the thing, if you trust in Jesus, you can write your name at the end of that sentence. And I'd encourage you to do that, okay? Perhaps even now, perhaps when you get home. I find no basis for a charge against Put your name on. Because if you trust in Jesus, that's what God says of you. I find no basis for a charge against that person because Jesus has paid it for them. And so can I encourage you this week, trust in Jesus if you haven't yet done that. And if you have, and you are burdened with guilt,
take that guilt to Jesus. Okay, whatever it might be, whatever failing you're struggling with, remember those words. I find no basis for a charge against this person. That's what God says of you now. Because of Jesus and what he has done for us. And for those of us who struggle with cynicism, do you remember how we started? Do you see what a remedy Jesus is? Because here's the thing about cynicism. It tends to point the finger elsewhere. Okay, it's the Edward Colstons of this world that are the real problem. Whereas the cross teaches you humility. And says, actually, yeah, you know what? I'm part of the problem as well. And so it teaches humility. That Actually, humility is a much better response to the problems of the world than cynicism. But also, it gives you hope. Because Jesus, when you trust in him, not only forgives you, he also changes you. So that increasingly, you can be part of the solution rather than part of the problem in this world as well. Give me your guilt and I'll give you my innocence, says Jesus to each of us today. Let's, uh, let's close with a moment of uh, kind of quiet reflection. Perhaps you might want to pray in the quietness of your own hearts. And so, Father, we thank you for your word today. Thank you for Jesus on the way to the cross, the innocent one condemned in the place of the guilty. And Lord, thank you that we are included in that list when we trust in Jesus. And we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to own that for ourselves, to trust that in our own lives as well. Amen. Well, we're going to have um, Thomas' family come to lead us in prayers. Thanks so much, guys. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful spring day, for the green starting to show on trees, for the flowers on bloom, for the songs of the birds. Thank you that it all points to you as the creator and sustainer of everything. You are, control, you are in control of everything. Thank you. We are sorry for the time if you have taken one another for our health or work or kindness and fun for granted. Sorry for thinking about ourselves so much more than we think of others. Please help us to be people of thankfulness and gratitude. Firstly, towards you, but also towards others. May we also be positive influences at home, school, work and church. Thank you for the plans to come out of lockdown soon. Thank you that the vaccination programme is gradually making it safer for people in Britain. But we pray that countries will work together to make sure that, that it isn't just the rich nations that benefit from the amazing scientific work that has been done. Please help us to to be concerned enough to pray for those around the world who need support or are just or, or are being persecuted because they love Jesus and want to share the good news with everyone. We thank you for Trinity at four and ask that we'll be a church full of people that love you and want to share the good news of the gospel with everyone too. We thank you for the Easter services coming up soon starting next week with Palm Sunday. Please may we be praying for conversations with others that lead to opportunities to speak about Jesus and invite them to church too. Thank you that you are with us right now and that you love to answer our prayers. Thank you that Jesus taught us how to pray and that we can join together in saying the Lord's Prayer now. Oh. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thanks.
so much, guys. Um, so we're, we're going to share communion now. Let me just explain how that will work. Um, we've got some little um, disposable, all-in-one um, communion things, which means that um, there's no risk of any kind of contamination. So it's got a little bit of bread in the top, a little bit of wine underneath. So pick one up as it comes around, and then, and then you can um, have both bread and wine at the same time. Um, communion is, is a celebration, remembering all that Jesus has done for us. It's for those who know and trust Jesus, are following in his ways. If that's not you yet, please don't feel any awkwardness at all about, uh, about not receiving. I'll just kind of go around the different seating blocks. And if you'd rather not, for whatever reason, just indicate that to me. And that's how I might be able to um, say a prayer for you instead. But as we begin, here's a prayer set by the Church of England um, as we celebrate uh, communion. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby his one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. He instituted and in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your son, our savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night as he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of a new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. And we're joined together now in the um, prayer on the back page of our service sheets. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Well, there'll be some music playing as well whilst we share communion. So I hope that'll be a good chance to reflect. And as we take communion today, perhaps you might remember those little cards of paper. I find no basis of the charge against you. That's what, as you trust in Jesus, as you take the bread and wine, that's what's true for you.
we, we join together in the prayer printed at the bottom of our service sheets. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us by faith with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, just before a final prayer, a couple of things to mention from me. Um, uh, one important thing to say is that this time next week, Trinity 4, we're going to be back at Christchurch. Okay, so we, the, for, for those who are kind of newish, we <laughs> kind of COVID has slightly kind of played with, played with some of the plans, but we've moved to Christchurch because in ordinary circumstances, it's the only way that we can accommodate all the young children who we, um, who we kind of would normally have coming along. So we are, lots of our kids are still meeting, by the way, they're down at St. Mary's on the bridge doing their own session at the moment. But from next week, we're going to be coming all back together at Christchurch. There's plenty of space. They've got a big balcony as well. So it means there's loads of space to fit everyone in with the distancing and so on. Um, and that's going to be an altogether service. So I hope it will be a really special time. For the first time in a little while, we'll have all a good number of kids back in um, with us as well. So we'll have altogether services for the next three Sundays down at Christchurch. And then we'll remain at Christchurch going through into the summer um, as well. So that's a reminder this time next week. We'll make sure someone's stationed here just in case anyone forgets. It's only five minutes from here. But uh, if you can remember, that would, um, that would help as well. Um, yeah, and then the final thing just to say is we those who get the newsletter, by the way, if you don't get the newsletter and would like to, let me know because we can sign you up for that list. It kind of keeps you in touch with what's going on. Um, but you'll have picked up our kind of finance communications the last couple of weeks. Um, thank you so much to all of those who've already got in touch, um, kind of re reviewing their, their kind of giving and, um, and, and pledging new giving and so on. Um, and just to say that this week, um, is the kind of last, the last week we'd encourage you to, to do that. It'd be nice to have, have all of those in for the end of this week. And I, there's one more communication coming later this week. Um, so that's just to say thank you um, for, uh, for that as well. We'll be on at 8am tomorrow morning for, for our Lent reflection on Zoom, if you fancy joining us. And if you're wondering about any details for these, again, get on the mailing list and then you'll have all of those in your, in your inbox. Good. Well, that's all from me. And why don't we close now with a final prayer? And so now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant, brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Do stick around and have a chat, but please would you do that outside rather than inside? And please try and do, do that one on one rather than um, in uh, any, any bigger groups, if that's okay. Thank you so much, and hope to see you again at Christchurch next week.